So if I don't see you, you're going to have to like holler at me, all right? Good to see you all this morning. Glad you're here. Chapter 20 of Luke is where we are. This book is winding up. And uh, I was going to say the story is winding up, but no, not really. It's just starting. The the story of the earthly life of Jesus is, is winding up. That part is winding up. But really, that just leads into the very exciting events that take place after the resurrection and the establishment of the Lord's church. And, of course, that story is going to continue. Matt Carter is going to continue a, a class here in the auditorium on the book of Acts, which is just kind of a continuation of what we've been studying here, you know, through Luke. And there's a class continuing downstairs uh, in the Minor Prophets. I'll be a part of that class down there in the third quarter. But... I kind of hate to miss going on into the story because it is that continuing story. I, I just love the way it's connected. But today, Luke chapter 20. As we begin, we're going to do so with prayer. and Dan is going to lead us here as we begin. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful for the preservation of life that you allow us to wake into this day. Be able to assemble the you and humble ourselves before you to be able to partake in, in your word to learn more of you and of your son. We pray, Father, that you would be with Joe and the other teachers of this hour, that they would have a regular remembrance of the things that they have prepared. And for us as students of thine, we pray, Father, we may take these things that we learn and we can apply them to our lives. That we can be more diligent in our service unto you. We're so thankful, Father, for this wonderful world that you have created for us, this beautiful day that we have, this time that we have to spend together in fellowship one with another. We pray, Father, that you would be with us in your son's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Tim, do you, did you have an outline for Wednesday? No. Okay. So, uh, Tim Walker is going to continue this class, the next three class periods, because I'll be gone. And um, so the outline for chapter 21 is out in the hallway. Be sure that you, you pick that up. So we, we, we think about where we left off Wednesday night. Jesus coming into town, that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, caused quite a stir, didn't it? It was a lot of attention given to that. Then in the evening, he went outside the town again, went over probably to Bethany for the night. And then the next day, now here we are probably on Tuesday morning, he he has come back into town. And um, remember how he he wept for the city of Jerusalem, knowing what it once was and all that had happened there through the generations. And he knows what's going to happen now. I mean, he knows that here in just a short time, he's going to be crucified. He knows what's going to happen in Jerusalem in the next short decades to come. And in Matthew's account in particular, in greater detail, he talks about the destruction that it will come to Jerusalem. That came to pass in AD 70. And so then Jesus cleansed the temple is where we kind of left that story on on Wednesday evening. And here we come into chapter 20. And again, it's it's probably on Tuesday of the week of his crucifixion. The Jewish leaders are are more intent now than ever at trying to find some reason to charge Jesus to be able to take him out of the way, out of their way. And because really he's become a thorn in their side. You know, they don't want them around. For a long time they've been feeling that way. But, I mean, after the events of this week, and now the cleansing of the temple again, the second time he's done that. We can only imagine just how frustrated these unfaithful leaders of the Jews have become. And so they're looking for ways that they can make false charges against him or something to bring him to trial. But Jesus is not hiding. I think we mentioned this the other night. I mean, here his work has not at any time been done in a vacuum, but has been wide open as he has taught the gospel of truth. So in chapter 20, the first verse, you know, it says, And it came to pass on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached, 
the gospel that the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, uh, that, that they were there and they spoke to him. But now, stop for a moment. So the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Hell no, we've actually talked about who is that? I mean, uh, how would you explain the chief priests? And we're not talking about the high priest, okay? This is the, the chief priests. Who might that be? Any ideas? The chief priests. That's not really defined for us real well in Scripture. The more prominent chiefs among the priests. Okay. So, so there were some that were probably over the other priests, you know, because the, the priests were kind of divided into different areas of responsibility. And these were probably those who were over them and had, you know, authority in the temple, you know, kind of organizing and making some things, make sure things are done. Had custody maybe to the temple, some have said. And the scribes, who, who is that? Who are the scribes? Lawyers, okay, well, explain that. Like, when I think of a lawyer, I, you know, I think of Perry Mason, you know, Matlock, you know, lawyer. What, what, do, we, what do you mean lawyers? Okay. So, so they knew. They knew the law. These are perhaps the ones who would have made the copies and, and they, they, I mean, if, if you had a question about where do you, I, sometimes those questions, are, where do you know that passage that says such and such, you know, you would probably go to the scribes to ask that, you know, the ones that knew the law. And, um, and the elders, now who might the elders be? We're not talking about church elders like we've studied about, but who would these elders be? more experienced perhaps, or maybe um, with that, the heads of the tribes, various tribes, you know, that, that are there, the clans within the tribes, and would likely be in that position, maybe because of more experience and, and some things as that. So you have to kind of think that through. Sometimes people read that and they see elders, and we think of church elders. It's a funny thing in, in Africa. When we talk about elders, we have to spend some time distinguishing who are elders in the Bible because in every village you go into, there are, there is, there are elders or an elder of the village. And sometimes there's, there's a little bit of a problem, you know, the elder of the village thinking that he is also the elder of the church, you know, and you have to kind of sort that out, okay? So we see the word, you know, used in different ways is my point. Okay, too much time on that. But just want to kind of set in place, who are the ones? These are the leaders of the Jews. These are the ones who have authority. These are the ones that other Jews would listen to, to give some, some counsel, to, to give direction on what we should be doing. And so many of the other Jews are looking for their cues from these leaders. And these leaders right now are fully focused on Jesus. And everything that he is doing and everything that he is saying. And so now they've come to Jesus, verse 2, and they spoke to him saying, Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, or who is he who gave you this authority? And he answered and he said to them, I also will ask you one thing. And answer me, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us, for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. And they answered that they did not know where it was from. And Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So there are three questions that have been asked here. You know, I had a, my question on the outline was, uh, what question did they ask Jesus, and was it a good question? Actually, they asked two questions. They asked two questions. What did they ask him? By what authority? And who gave you this authority? Why was that important? And, and what does that tell us? Well, what insight does that give us? Okay, so they're, they're trying to set this up in such a way for maybe for him to say, well, I'm the son of God. That's my authority. 
So, so there is that. You know, they're looking for that. But I think there's something else that tells us, too, the fact that they ask those two questions. What do we learn from that? What does it say? He asked them, by what authority? Who gave you this authority? What does that tell us? That what? Okay, so they recognize the need of authority. Okay, they recognize the need of authority in religion. They also recognize that authority has to come from one who has the power to give it. Now, that, those aren't bad questions. In fact, those are incredible questions. Those are the kind of questions that sometimes we need to be asking. And, and so there's nothing wrong with the questions, but Jesus knew where they were going with that. And he kind of turned that around and asked them a question about the baptism of John. And well, now we learn something about the hearts of these Jewish leaders. The dishonest nature of the hearts of these Jewish leaders. Because when he asked them the question, the baptism of John... Uh, where was it from? Why did they struggle so much to answer that? They, they couldn't answer honestly. Well, they could, but they couldn't because they were stuck, right? So, so they were stuck between two sides if they answered this correctly. And so it's like, it's like, wow. Um, you have to think about how they stood there and they reasoned this out. They had to talk among themselves about how we're going to answer this. Because they knew they had to give a very careful answer. Or they would pin themselves down. They were trying to pin Jesus. It didn't work that way. He turned that around on them. They were stuck. If they admitted the baptism of John was of God, they would also have to admit that Jesus was the Christ. You thought about that? Because, because if, if they say that, G, that uh, John the Baptist was of God, then why aren't you listening? Why didn't you obey him? Why don't you listen to him? But see, if they admit that he is from God, they would have to also admit that, that Jesus was of God. Because remember the testimony of John the Baptist. Like in John chapter 1, you remember when Jesus came walking onto the scene there, and it was John who said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, in John 1, verse 29. All right? So John is identifying Jesus as the one who has come to save the world. And then in, uh, in verse 32, John writes that John the Baptist bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. And I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Verse 34, And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So to admit that John the Baptist is of God is to admit Jesus is his Son. Oh, they couldn't do that. They, they, were, they were stuck, you see. So Jesus then did not respond. But we see now the dishonest hearts of the Jewish leaders. We've known that. We've seen it already. But now in just this incredibly clear way, we see and we identify the dishonest hearts of, of those Jewish leaders. Yes? Right, right. It was, it was a basic premise Which would be the same as calling Jesus legalistic, wouldn't it? You know, and, and so it's like it, Jesus is telling us something about asking the right questions, you know, in, in dealing with questions. And there's nothing wrong with asking questions. There's nothing wrong with us holding each other accountable on statements we make or saying, well, I believe we should do this, to say, well, why? Why so? Because Jesus might ask us that. We have to establish all things by authority, and Jesus is helping us see that. So, 
in this next section of scripture here, it goes into another parable. Luke's account only has one parable here. Matthew's account has three, kind of all along the same line. But Luke has just recorded one of those here. It's a very strong, powerful parable in, in what Jesus is saying through this, this teaching. And as we kind of work our way through that a little bit, because the parable is always always force me to have to stop and think a little. I'm not saying I always get them quickly. You know, it's, that, that it's an earthly story that we should understand. And sometimes it's, it's making that spiritual application where we have to think and understand it in that context. But what is interesting here is that the Jewish leaders, they get it. They know what Jesus is talking about. They know of whom he is speaking. And they want to make some quick application to that. So let's look at this parable. We're Luke chapter 20. We're going to read it. Verse 9. And he began to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country for a long time. And at harvest time he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might give him some of the fruit from the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. And again he sent another servant, and they beat him also, treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty handed. And he sent a third, and they wounded him and also cast him out. Then the owner of the, of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will respect him when they see him. But the vine dressers saw him. They reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. And they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, Certainly not. And he looked to them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls it will grind him into powder. And the chief priests and the scribes the same hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. You think so? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, this was, this was directly against those Jewish leaders. Let's talk about this here for a minute. You know, the, the, the reason that Jesus is, is telling the parable, you know, we have to think first about his audience. There are disciples that are there that have been following. And, and then, of course, there are the, the Jewish leaders. So the image of a vineyard is something that would have been easy for them to understand. In northern Galilee, there were, and there still are, a lot of vineyards in northern Galilee. And it was not uncommon that there would be someone, maybe even a foreigner, who owns a vineyard but has someone who is taking care of that. He goes and he visits from time and he takes some of the profits or the, the produce from that. That was understood without any, any difficulty. And then we have to consider as well that a vineyard was a familiar symbol for Israel in the Old Testament. There are some passages that in very direct ways, you know, connect a vineyard to, to Israel. Uh, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 5 does that. And in Psalm 80, I believe it is. And so you think now about those, those points and think about it's three days. Three days before Jesus dies. And the message of the Lord is becoming more pointed. We've talked about this in the last couple of lessons, I think. You know, that as, as, as we've studied through three or almost three and a half years with the life of Jesus and the, and the message that he has been given, the preaching that he's been doing, as we come to the end here, he's come to this point where he's not mincing any words. I mean, he's, now he is, the, he is most direct. He is now saying to the Jewish leaders, he, he might as well just come out and said, I'm talking about you. Because they got it. 
I mean, they, they understood what he was saying to them. But what is he saying to them? I mean, let's, let's reason this out just a, a, a little bit. You know, the man, if we're trying to make application to the parable, the man who planted the vineyard, who would that be? Making application, spiritual, God. God is the one who planted the vineyard. And the connections with Israel of old would have to be something that would, that would connect there. And so the vine dressers, who are the ones taking care of that vineyard? What's that? The, the, Jew, the Jewish, yeah, Jewish leaders. You know, if God made the vineyard and the vineyard is connected to Israel, who's taking care of Israel? Who's supposed to be taking care of Israel? The, the J Jewish leaders would be the ones that are supposed to be. They're there, you know, uh, pruning the vines and, and, and taking care of it that way. But then there are messengers that come from the owner of the vineyard. And that being God. He, messengers. Who are the messengers? The prophets. Yeah, yeah. You know, God spoke through prophets, of course. There were kings, judges, priests. You know, God sent messengers many times. You know, sometimes I, you know, I'm very quick to say, well, he, he sent prophets. Yes, he did. Many prophets. But that's not all. There were others that God sent, remember? You know, the kings that were his representative. And of course, the priests were supposed to be that, you know, under the old law. And, and so, we, you know, in the example here, there are three uh, messengers sent, you know. In, in real life, real time through the years, God sent hundreds of messengers with his will. Think about that. I mean, I, 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 I made that connection a little bit this week. You know, how many times has God tried to help Israel understand his will? How many times did he send messengers to express his will or to call them to repentance or, or to teach him more fully his, his will? Okay, so now we have... You know, the, okay, so d d we, what about the son, the son of the vineyard owner? Jesus. Jesus. So very directly. Now, as Jesus is telling this story, you know, John the Baptist, you know, uh, proclaimed him to be the son of God back in the beginning. Jesus has identified himself as being the son of man, being the son of God, and has become more forthright about that here in the latter part of his ministry. They know that Jesus claims to be the son of God. And so now in this parable, when the owner of the vineyard sends his son, but they kill him, what does Jesus say? Jesus, Jesus knows. Yeah, Jesus knows what's going to happen. And he's accusing them before it happens of killing him. Well, what have the Jewish leaders already been trying to do? They're already trying to dispose of him. And so you see how directly this hits the Jewish leaders. I mean, they, they're not walking away saying like, what's he talking about? Oh, no. They know. And maybe they're thinking, how does he know? Because they understand what he is saying. We said something a few moments ago about the dishonest hearts of the Jewish leaders. And now we see just how powerfully that stands out. I mean, Jesus, Jesus is trying to move them. He's trying to change them. But a dishonest heart can't be moved. We already understand that. Chapter 15, we, you know, we, we talk about um, the parable of the sower. Chapter 8. The parable of the sower. The power of the word and spreading the word. 
The word that grows and produces a hundredfold is the word that falls on an honest or noble heart. An honest heart. The word of God that falls on a dishonest heart is not going to grow. It's not a problem with the word. It's with the heart. And so we, we're seeing one of the storylines here that to me just stands out so much as we're coming to the end of this earthly life of Jesus and those that he is interacting with is the extreme difference between those who have an honest and good heart and those who are dishonest. And I want so much for that to stand out in our mind and our understanding because it is just as applicable to us today. And we have to be real careful to make sure that our hearts are honest in seeking him and accepting him. Because it's real easy to close off our heart to things that the Lord would have us know and things he would have us do. It is real easy to close that off and to reject him. And, and simply, the bottom line is, if we are unwilling to accept what he says and to submit to his will, we are rejecting Jesus. We are rejecting the Son of God. We have cast our own eternity in motion when we reject Jesus. And it has everything in the world to do with our heart. Powerful lessons come out of this. I'm wondering, what, what, else, what else are you seeing? Anything else from the parable, from the lesson here? What else do you see? What, what verse are you pulling out of? really good question and I think it's not real hard to understand if we, if we think it through. This is one of the final pieces on the parable. You know when he says I'm going to destroy these vine dressers these Jewish leaders and going to give it to others give the vineyard to, some, to others what is going to be given by the owner of the vineyard. What, what is going to be given? That's what we have to kind of think through. Now, I'm not sure they would have understood that part, you know. Wait, wait, where is it going to go? If the vineyard is going to go away, and if the vineyard is speaking of Israel, what, what, what is Jesus saying here? Okay, salvation is going to go to the Gentiles, but it's like, you know, what, what can those Jews be hearing when, they're, when Jesus is saying this? Because, I mean, they would be just totally removed from these, these evil Gentiles over here. So the chosen people are going to be rejected. And, and so from their ears hearing this, they have to be thinking, I mean, I, I, how could God... How could God not choose us because we are the people? You know, and, and the, the, I, it seemed to, in my mind, maybe this is wrong, but I'm thinking all the way through this, they, they're seeing, they're understanding exactly what Jesus is saying and of whom he is speaking. But now this last part, would this be harder for them to understand? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. They must have understood something because their response when they heard it was, certainly not. God can't take away from us, from the chosen. He can't take away from us what, it, what we have. But Jesus is saying, yeah, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. 
Yeah. Perhaps they could think of it from the standpoint that God's going to remove these leaders, but can't remove from Israel their chosen position. I just wonder what they're thinking with that. Let's hold your finger here. Let's go over. Corey, what do you got? They're still going to be leaders. It's going to be viewed a little bit. The Jewish nation is going to go away. And yet there is still going to be a nation of Israel. It's a spiritual nation. Because the church and those who are, who are in Christ's church can still be viewed as that spiritual Israel. But it's not going to be the nation that they have been so accustomed to. Real quickly, in Matthew chapter 21... Matthew's account gives a, a little more detail and, and responds a little bit, uh, includes a little bit more of the response of the rulers, you know, that the owner will destroy these wicked and wicked men and lease the vineyard to, to others. In Matthew chapter 21, um, in, and in verse 41, he, you know, he says that. And, and so the, the physical story of the parable gets, gets real. They, they get that. It's the spiritual application that they didn't enjoy. There in Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Uh, therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Again, just the point, honest hearts or dishonest hearts, they see and they understand what Jesus is saying. They're not stepping back and saying, who are you talking about? No, they know. They, they know and they understand very well exactly what Jesus is, is talking about here. And, and the passage quoted um, from the Old Testament in both of these texts, you know, that we read about the, the, the chief cornerstone, of course, is, is applicable to Jesus. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, you know, we find that same passage that is used and it's being applied to Jesus being that chief cornerstone. And basically he's saying to those Jewish leaders, you're, you're tripping over the chief cornerstone. You know, it's right here. You know, it's right here before you. And it's what the prophets had foretold long before. And so, you know, um, they knew that he was speaking about them. And so we can only imagine these Jewish leaders, how they were seething in anger. And they want so much to kill Jesus. They can't right now because the multitude. The multitude is there and listening to him, and they see him as a prophet. And so that's, that's why they can't reach out and get him right now, but they're not finished. Okay, very quickly, going through the rest of the chapter, just kind of doing a very brief overview to see where the rest of the chapter uh, goes here. So they try to, to um, find a, me, a means to accuse him, you know, the, the, um, trying to trap him, you know, in the things he says in verses 19 through 26. You know, the, the question about paying taxes, you know, how, what should happen here? And so it's men who come to him who are pretending to be religious, the text says, you know, um, but, but that's all. They were just asking questions. Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach us the way of God more truly. I mean, like their teeth should be rattling when they're saying this because they don't even believe what they're saying. You know, they're, they're just trying to, to, to make it flowery and sound good when they say these things. Jesus knows right off, says, why do you test me? 
And the question was about paying taxes. And Jesus took the coin and said, you know, whose inscription? Caesar. Render to Caesar what is Caesar. And to God the things that are God's. Interesting add to that. You know, in, in giving some preference to God in that. And they were stuck again. They marveled. They kept silent because they couldn't say anything more. In verses 27 through 40, more questioning here about the resurrection. You know, the, still trying to find fault to accuse Jesus here. But there's some new players that come to the field, the Sadducees, you know. And so the Sadducees is that group that was very powerful among the Jews, the, the various sects of the Jews. And, and they, they wielded a lot of power because um, uh, they, they, many of the priests were of the Sadducees, and particularly the high priest at this time belonged to the party. So they had a lot of power right now. And so their effort was to catch Jesus, you know, in, in his words, and they, they give him a, a what-if scenario. You know, what if a man has a wife and he dies and his brother takes him, her for a, a wife, you know, seven times over in heaven, whose wife should, should she be? And so they're making a reference to what the law taught through Moses, you know, about how this should be taken care of. Their question is about heaven. You know, the response of Jesus back is trying to, to he's making this, this point here that you're trying to compare some earthly things to heavenly things. And these don't align. These aren't the same thing. And in short, it, it got them stuck again. They didn't know what to say. The chapter ends with Jesus giving a, a very powerful and strong warning. Um, and, and the nature of the Messiah. He gives some description about the nature of the Messiah and his kingdom. There's some comparison between physical and spiritual. The kingdom of our Lord is a spiritual kingdom. He's proclaimed that all the way through. They're still not understanding that or seeing that. And even today sometimes, I think we still struggle to understand truly the nature of our Lord's kingdom as a spiritual kingdom. Maybe it becomes even clearer as the next three days go forward and the events that follow. The spiritual nature of the Lord's kingdom. The one who becomes king sitting at the right hand of God. No, not sitting on a physical throne in Jerusalem like they expected and wanted, but a king nonetheless, sitting in heavens, in heaven's throne. That's our Lord, the king of a spiritual kingdom, greater than physical Israel could have ever been. So the story continues. We stop there for now, our time is gone. But Wednesday night, chapter 21, be sure to pick up an outline so you can be prepared for that. And Read over the chapter and you'll be ready to go. Thank you so much for being here this morning.